Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Galvin. I'm Director of Global Seminars at UC San Diego, and I'd like to welcome you to the Family Orientation Webinar. Tonight we have a 60-minute time slot, and we will take about 40 minutes of that for a presentation, and then we'll open it up for your questions. First, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce um, our staff. So, uh, Tonya Pizer and Lisa Armstrong will be joining us tonight. My colleague, Cree Howland, uh, is away today. Um, but we're the Global Seminar team, and we have been working with your sons and daughters to help them prepare for this study abroad experience. I'd like to start out uh, by uh, covering how we can work together because. Truly, the families are uh, an indispensable part of this support network for these young people. And we really value all that you can contribute uh, to help preparing your sons and daughters for the experience, as well as potentially providing some support while they're away. Um, the first point I'd like to emphasize is uh, the value of letting go but staying in touch. It's in some ways similar to what you've already done when you sent them off to college for their first year. Uh, it's being there uh, for them, but also letting them explore the world to uh, develop their independence uh, and their self-confidence. Now, occasionally a student will write home and say uh, something is really wrong, but not everything really is a crisis. If the shower isn't working, there's a local on-site uh, professional staff who they will meet their first day who can call in a plumber. Or, you know, if they're not feeling well, that same local center director will be able to get them to a clinic or a hospital. So uh, the reality is you, uh, from five, 10,000 miles away, do not have to solve these crises. If they're a little bit homesick, sure, uh, that's a great uh, way to help. But uh, if you know, you know your sons and daughters, of course, better than anyone else. So if they uh, seem to be more than a little homesick, have them speak to the local uh, staff that they will meet the very first day they're in country. And uh, you know, if they needed to see a counselor, there would be someone to help them with that. Um, and I should just add that in all of our locations uh, for Global Seminars, we have both the UC San Diego professor who is there but also local staff, whether it's in Germany or Spain or Japan or wherever, uh, who know the local language, who know where the doctors and the hospitals are, uh, who can get a plumber or an electrician if need be, who can help them with uh, adjusting to the local culture, uh, who can recommend a good uh, place uh, for sushi on the weekend. Uh, so they are not alone. They meet these people. Uh, their very first day, and they will be able to stay in touch with them throughout their five weeks. Now, uh, another uh, important uh, organizing principle to let you all know about is a federal law. It's called FERPA, Federal Education Rights Privacy Act. And essentially, it's a privacy law for all college students. Since they are adults, uh, we have to protect their private information they can authorize us to release that information to you, the family. Uh, and uh, we're happy to provide a release form to the student. But please understand that we are uh, governed by that law. So we're not able to share uh, everything. Um, this presentation, I should add, will be archived on our study abroad website. So you don't have to take notes on all of it. It will be available for you to review at your convenience. And um, our uh, website, uh, the Global Seminar website, uh, globalseminar.ucsd.edu, uh, is where we uh, maintain the information. Um, and uh, this uh, presentation will also be uh, at our main website under the Family tab. The uh, at any point you can access this information. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about safety abroad because for the most part, um, the bulk of our questions tend to involve safety. And that is the highest priority that we have 
uh, for your sons and daughters and our professors. Uh, we have been running the Global Seminar Program for more than a decade now. We've sent over 2,000 students abroad on more than 100 global seminars. And uh, we have brought all of our students home safely. And so we're very proud of that safety record. We take safety very seriously. Uh, it's the most important thing we do. And I'm going to be talking to you tonight about how uh, we keep your sons and daughters safe. Um, so the question, uh, will my child be safe abroad? Uh, they have a very strong support network. So the UC San Diego professor who will be teaching the two global seminar courses is in country with the students. And many of our faculty have lived and taught in the cities where they will be teaching the global seminars. So they have uh, a lot of expertise. But uh, we also have to uh, back up our faculty, we have full-time professional in-country support staff. And uh, as I mentioned before, these are folks who can get a student to a doctor if they're not feeling well, uh, get them to a counselor if they're feeling depressed, um, fix a leaky faucet, uh, provide advice on travel uh, during the weekends. Um, so there's a full support network. In the event of an emergency, if there was a natural disaster or heaven forbid a terrorist attack, they would be working with the professor and with our team here in La Jolla to support your sons and daughters. Now, uh, every Global Seminar student will have a pre-departure orientation. All of our Global Seminars have uh, had the pre-departure orientations uh, except for Prague and that uh, orientation is tomorrow. So all of the students will have met with their professor. Uh, they will have received information from our local in-country uh, partners, uh, professional staff, uh, and of course from the study abroad team here. And these pre-departure orientations cover health, safety, cultural adjustment, airport arrival, pickup, uh, all the basic logistics, recommendations on things to pack. Uh, so they're very comprehensive. And the students uh, will receive a packet of information. Sometimes it's a hard copy, sometimes it's sent to them electronically, but it will cover that information. So we recommend that if you have specific questions about the housing location or the airport pickup or things like that, just ask your son or daughter for their uh, a copy of their pre-departure orientation materials, and that's going to answer all of those logistical questions. Now, in addition to that pre-departure orientation, all students in all programs will have an on-site orientation that first day they arrive. Uh, they will meet the on-site full-time professional staff. Uh, they will uh, have a discussion about health and safety, logistics. They'll get checked into their housing. And, uh, and many times they will also go on a walking tour of the neighborhood that uh, familiarizes them with the location and it also helps them adjust with the jet lag. Uh, now, in addition to all of that, uh, there is study abroad insurance for health issues and emergency evacuations. It's called UC Trips Insurance and all students are signed up for that. It happens to be free as well. So uh, this will provide uh, support in case they you know, have a you know, sprained ankle and need to have that looked at at a clinic, uh, up to and including, you know, an emergency evacuation in the event that there was a natural disaster or, you know, an individual health crisis. So that is covered. Uh, we do tell the students to be sure to keep the copy of the uh, insurance card, which they get when they register uh, for the UC trips, to keep that in their purse or wallet. Now, in addition to that, when they sign up for the UC Trips Insurance, they're automatically registered with uh, an organization called iJet. The University of California, Office of the President, uh, has contracted with iJet to provide security updates and support to all UC faculty, students, and staff who may be abroad for uh, study abroad or research or other activities. Uh, this is an organization that is staffed by retired diplomats as well as uh, actually special forces people. 
And we have used iJet in the past, uh, for example, to bring people out of Japan after the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. Uh, and uh, we also uh, used them in Egypt years ago uh, during the Egyptian revolution. Uh, and we sent in an extraction team, brought all 31 students and faculty out, and everyone was out safe. Uh, so in the event something very serious happens, we will be on it. We can assure you of that. Now, in addition to all of this, uh, the State Department, provides uh, security notifications. And you can follow along with this at the State Department website, travel.state.gov. We watch that so you can too. Uh, we also encourage all uh, students to sign up for the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, or STEM. They just go to the State Department website, type in where they're going to be and when, and uh, they can get uh, security updates as well from our government, from our embassy. So I think you see from all of these points that your sons and daughters have a substantial amount of support. And uh, we hope we never need to use it, but if we do have to use it, it is there. Now, uh, what can students do to reduce risks while abroad? Almost all of these fall under the category of common sense. So uh, the first is to establish a relationship with the uh, on-site professional staff. Uh, as well as their uh, fellow classmates. You know, uh, asking for help or advice uh, or, you know, questions about the local conditions, uh, that's what our professors and local staff are there for. Uh, getting to know their fellow classmates allows them to create the buddy system. Uh, we always tell students, never go somewhere alone. Always go with friends especially if you're going out uh, for dinner in the evening or uh, to go dancing or if you're planning to take a trip uh, uh, out of town for the weekend, uh, practice the buddy system. And tell the uh, program staff about their travel plans. So, you know, if you're going from Rome uh, to Florence for the weekend, uh, let the staff know that way, if for some reason you don't come to class on Monday morning, we'll know where to start looking uh, if we haven't been called in advance. So uh, that's always very important. They shouldn't go off on their own. It's also important that uh, on their first day in country that they provide their local cell phone number to the local staff and the professor. We know that some students will get an international calling plan for their smartphone. We know that others may decide to buy a, a, a cheap uh, or rent a cheap cell phone uh, in country and put in a SIM card. Um, most of these students uh, these days are activating an international calling plan on their smartphone, uh, but uh, they don't use the, the telephone a lot, uh, especially not to call home. They'll use Skype or something else that's free uh, because international calling plans can add up. Uh, those can be pricey if you're using them a lot instead of just for a quick message. They should also keep their abroad address on them so that if they're taking a taxi home, you know, and uh, they, they, they forget which street or whatever, they can pull it out of their purse or wallet, show it to the driver, and they'll you know, get home safe and sound. Another piece of advice is not to wear the wrong clothing. And, you know, of course, we're all very proud uh, to be with UCSD or to be Californians or you know, USA, but uh, we generally recommend students not to wear clothing that uh, distinguishes them, you know, stands out from the crowd. It's better to blend in. And that's much less for things like terrorism than simply pickpocketing. Uh, you know, that's pickpocketing, twisted ankles, and traveler's diarrhea. Those are the three things that we see, you know, during the summer. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude less stressful than things you might see on you know, TV news. Uh, know where the uh, consulate is in the city where they are and register through that uh, um, Smart Traveler Enrollment Program with the State Department. Uh, very importantly, before they go, uh, scan a copy of the passport, uh, the page with their photo and passport number, as well as the front and back of credit cards. 
scan that and email copies to themselves. That way, if for some reason they are pickpocketed, uh, they can reconstitute those documents very quickly and also put a stop on their credit cards. I've already mentioned it's important to stick with the group, don't go off alone, practice the buddy system, just common sense. And finally, uh, this goes under the category of, if you wouldn't do it here, why would you do it abroad? So, you know, uh, things like bungee jumping or extreme sports, uh, handling wild animals or snakes or things like this, or joining into, you know, potentially violent political demonstrations, you wouldn't do it here, so use common sense, don't do it abroad. Okay, some other points about personal safety. Uh, learn about different attitudes, taboos, and cultural practices regarding dating. This is something that uh, can be discussed with the on-site professional staff. And, you know, again, common sense. If someone is showing uh, too much uh, interest or is being overly friendly, uh, you know, this is why it's good to have the buddy system and, you know, they should be looking out for each other uh, and, uh, you know, extract from that situation. Uh, dress codes uh, can be very different in other cultures. You know, California beachwear may be fine here in California, but it may send inadvertent signals to people who've watched too many bad Hollywood movies. And uh, so, you know, it's better to dress a little more, uh, you know, cautiously or conservatively uh, when, when going out. Uh, and also for many locations, if for example, you're going through a church or a cathedral as part of class, you know, that's not a time to wear shorts and flip-flops and ripped uh, t-shirts. Uh, they expect you to dress a little bit more, uh, you know, appropriately for that. Uh, we've talked about the buddy system. Watch out for offers from strangers. Notify the full-time professional on-site staff if they're going to be doing any weekend travel. And it's very important to know this is a study abroad program, so we expect them in class Monday morning. Uh, there's no exception to uh, skipping class. That's not allowed and they will lose a lot of points for doing that. Uh, and also very important to carry their health insurance card with them at all times. If they are ill and have to go to the hospital or clinic, um, they will need to file a health insurance claim within 24 hours and all the claim information is on the health insurance card as to who they call and what they do. And the full-time staff there can assist them should that be necessary. Now, the next point I wanna emphasize is talk to your son and daughter before going abroad about setting up a communication plan in the event of some type of emergency. Whether there's a natural disaster, a terrorist incident, or if your son or daughter just falls ill, how are you gonna stay in touch? Uh, will it be Facebook, an email, WhatsApp, Skype? These are all very good options, but decide this in advance uh, and you know, test it out that first day or two uh, that they're in country just to make sure everything's working smoothly. Now, uh, your sons and daughters are gonna be very busy. These uh, five weeks are jam-packed, two full academic courses, uh, many educational excursions, plus they will be exploring the country. So. I know some parents are used to talking to their son or daughter every day. That may not be feasible, but if uh, you're on Facebook, uh, you may uh, see that they're posting photos and see that they're fine, or maybe you send a quick email and confirm that they're okay. But uh, uh, this is, again, part of the supporting them, but letting go a little bit. Uh, I want to reemphasize uh, Avoid overusing cell phones due to different billing practices overseas. Uh, every summer, there's at least one student who ends up with a real whopper of a cell phone bill for hundreds of dollars because they didn't realize uh, that it's different overseas. Roaming charges, et, et cetera, they're just entirely different rules. So check with your cell phone company before going abroad. Talk to your son and daughter about that so that they're very clear about when to use the cell phone and when to use email or Skype, which are free. Okay, insurance and theft prevention. Um, for personal property insurance, uh, you know, if you make sure that the laptop, computer, or iPad, or camera is on your homeowner's insurance, uh, 
that that often is a very smart thing to do. Um, know your deductibles so that uh, you know if you have a five hundred dollar deductible and a five hundred dollar iPad gets stolen, well, you know you won't get anything back for that. Um, use money belts. Uh, keep purses zipped and close in. Uh, wear backpacks in the front if you're in a crowded terminal or metro stop. Uh, keep everything zipped up. Uh, when I'm walking through uh, crowded public spaces abroad and in California, I'll put my wallet in my front pocket and I'll put my hand over it so that, you know, a pickpocket is going to have a much harder time getting it. And uh, this next point is very important. Please do not have your son or daughter bring irreplaceable keepsakes. You know, taking grandma's earrings or, you know, a, a very expensive uh, SLR camera or something like that. Uh, it's just not worth losing something of that value. Okay, next uh, broad category, we'd like to talk a little bit about health and well-being. Um, I always recommend uh, creating an emergency uh, card uh, you know, that they can take with them. These would be the basic uh, types of information uh, just to, to carry that with. Um, also, if they have a um, medical condition that requires prescriptions, bring enough of the medication for the full five weeks and bring a copy of the prescription. Keep it in the original pill bottles and uh, you know, bring that on the carry-on rather than check baggage. Uh, the TSA uh, may search that at the airport, but if you have the prescriptions, uh, you should be fine. We did have a student once who was trying to pack more efficiently, and he put all of his pills, poured them into a plastic Ziploc bag, and uh, that compressed very nicely and fit, but of course the security guards at the airport didn't know that these were prescription medications, and of course everything was seized and that was a real mess. So you don't want to do that. Okay, health and evacuation insurance. I've I mentioned this before, and I'll just emphasize again that Global Seminar students will have mandatory free health insurance, uh, uh, and they should sign up for the UC insurance um, at the following website. Now, they've all been told this in orientation, and so, uh, you know, you can just say, you know, to your son or daughter, do you have your UC TRIPS insurance card, you know, on you or have you emailed a copy to your email account. Uh, that's a nice way that we can partner together just to make sure they haven't forgotten something. But you can see what these cards look like. They have the United Healthcare Global Assist, they have a phone number on there. Um, so in the event of an emergency, uh, they can call that number. All right, so upon arrival in country, students will attend the health and safety orientation. Um, they will uh, learn the emergency contact number for the full-time professional staff, and they should keep that in their personal wallet. If at any point during the five weeks they have an illness, an emergency, they have adjustment issues or housing issues, anything, call the on-site director of the professional staff to help them. Again, you do not need to solve that. We are uh, very happy to have professionals on site to take care of all of that. If your son or daughter forgets that, just redirect them and tell them to contact the professional staff on site. Now, uh, one thing that I always like to emphasize is the fact that with international travel, uh, the body has to take some time to adjust to the new environment, and that includes fighting new germs. I always get sick when I travel internationally. Uh, and so that first week, you know, your son or daughter may come down with something. And, uh, you know, uh, if they need to be seen at the, the clinic or the pharmacy, the full-time professional staff will get them there. Um, they also may need more sleep. Now, of course, they may want to see everything and go 24-7, but sometimes it can be helpful just to tell them to get a good night's sleep and to eat a balanced diet. 
Another thing that you can do is remind them that uh, they should follow the local news. Uh, you know, the local newspaper or the local TV news or even the BBC.com, which covers news from all over the world. You know, if there's a major emergency in a country, BBC will pick it up. Um, uh, but they need to stay in touch. They can't uh, just completely tune out of things around them. Uh, and of course, in the event of an emergency, we would be sending messages to the students. So they need to respond to those messages promptly. Now, uh, it's important to uh, remember that uh, safety standards abroad may be somewhat different than the United States. So, you know, uh, street food stands, for example, may not have the same level of food safety inspection that uh, they would in the United States. So as a general practice, I tend to avoid those. I will go to a more established restaurant instead. Now, the local full-time professional staff can tell them about inexpensive uh, places with delicious food that the locals frequent. You know, avoid the tourist traps because those always charge double or triple. Now, uh, it's important, as I said before, that students bring a copy of any prescriptions and supply of medication in the original container. Alcohol and drugs, Now, I wanna spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, you can help us by emphasizing to your son or daughter that drinking practices are very different abroad. You know, in the United States, unfortunately, some college students engage in binge drinking uh, to be cool. Well, that is definitely not the practice anywhere else in the world. And in fact, uh, while they will be 18 and they will be of age to consume alcohol if they choose to, uh, while they are abroad in these countries. Uh, one drink is fine, you know. Uh, excessive drinking puts students at risk of sexual assault, of uh, being mugged or beaten up. Uh, and so we just do not want that to happen to anyone. So, you know, emphasize that they should, uh, if they choose to drink, they should drink responsibly. Uh, but also, you know, about a third of our students say they don't consume alcohol. So, you, you know, if you know your sons and daughters, if they don't, we completely respect that. They do not have to start drinking while they're abroad. They can uh, use, use their confidence uh, to say, no, I, I choose not to engage in, in, uh, in drinking here. Uh, and then they can be the designated person to, you know, help their friends. Now, the issue of drugs is different. Uh, you know, they should not engage in uh, the use of drugs abroad because that carries enormous uh, legal repercussions. And it's very important to understand uh, this because the U.S. Constitution does not apply abroad. The Constitution of whatever country they're in is the governing law. So if they engage in drug use, they could be jailed for months or more or years. And... Uh, you know, the local judge may throw the book at the visiting American who bought hashish or cocaine or something like that. So uh, we tend to not have problems in this area, but it's very important that they not uh, experiment with drugs while they're abroad. And just because marijuana has now been legalized in California does not mean it is legal uh, in other places uh, that they're going. So they should not think of marijuana as a benign uh, drug. That is not the way it is seen around the world. Uh, they would get into real legal jeopardy uh, if they were to bring marijuana uh, abroad or try to buy it. Okay, uh, success uh, and adjusting abroad. Knowing the culture, I think, is, is very important. Um, and, you know, some students will experience culture shock, just like they did as first-year college students. You may have gotten some calls that first year from your son or daughter about being really excited and things are going great and then the next week they didn't do as well on a midterm exam or something else happened and then you know it was uh, you know uh, a very stressful time so again I'd like to emphasize that not everything is a crisis and refer them uh, to speak with the on-site professional staff the center director the faculty member uh, they really have seen it all, and they are there to support your sons and daughters. And if, uh, in very, very rare instances, uh, the student really is having a difficult time adjusting, 
uh, we can get them to see a counselor uh, abroad. All right, next, uh, some pre-departure uh, planning advice. Uh, you may remember that I said your sons and daughters have received materials in their pre-departure orientation covering everything from the airport pickup uh, to what to do if their flight is delayed, who to call, what to do, um, housing information there, uh, what to pack, some cultural do's and don'ts, uh, all of these things. So you might want to sit down together at the kitchen table and review that, or maybe have them send you a copy. And you know, then if they're in another, if you're in another city, uh, you know, you could talk about it. Uh, uh, create a packing list. You know, uh, you don't have to pack as if you're joining the, uh, you know, uh, foreign legion here. Uh, most students probably pack too much. Um, but uh, because they, they will buy some clothes abroad typically, uh, and of course they can do laundry while they're there, so they don't need clothes for five weeks. Um, but uh, create that packing list. Um, remember to bring the plane tickets, passport, and visa if needed. Those are the most important things because if they forget a passport, oh my goodness, we had this happen once about seven years ago and that student had to buy a plane ticket and fly home. Uh, they, they would not let her into Europe uh, without the passport. And that's basically the case where, wherever they go. So they really do need those things. Um, the information about how to contact our provider, the, you know, the full-time local staff in country, they should carry that with them in their luggage or have that on their phone. But I always recommend having an actual paper hard copy because, you know, if the cell phone battery conks out or they don't have coverage when they get to the airport, it's always important to keep Murphy's Law in mind. They may be so used to everything technology working right that they may not understand that technology doesn't always work right in this world. And that if you have a hard copy with, you know, highlighters of what number to call or what to do, uh, if your plane is delayed uh, or where to go, uh, you know, again, if your plane is delayed and you need to get a taxi and if you've missed the airport pickup, they've got it right there in their carry-on, maybe right in their, their wallet or their purse, and they're not in a, in a panic. They just have it and they're ready to go if they need it. Uh, next, I recommend that all students bring the equivalent of $100 in local currency. The reason I say that is because if for some reason uh, you arrive at the airport late because your flight was delayed many hours and uh, you have to get a taxi and maybe you have to buy a sandwich uh, from the coffee shop in the airport and uh, their credit card machines are down or your credit card isn't swiping and it doesn't work, you know, you're going to need to pay in local currency. You're not going to be able to pull out U.S. dollars. So uh, you can go to your bank or your credit union or whatever, uh, but just to have that and make sure that you get uh, the smallest denomination bills that you can. You don't want to pull out the equivalent of a $100 bill and seem like the last of the big spenders from America. You know, try and get the smaller, smallest denomination bills uh, because if you're buying a sandwich or you're paying other things, they may not be able to make change for a big bill. Uh, and also to realize that in many of these countries, even in Western Europe, places like France, mom and pop shops and restaurants and uh, markets, they typically don't take credit cards. So you'll need to use your uh, card at an ATM machine, uh, maybe once a week, pull out the equivalent of 50 or $100 in local currency, uh, and then use that uh, because uh, they, they don't use plastic in other countries like we do here in this country. So that's another change. And you can help reinforce that with your sons and daughters. Now money, continuing this. I always recommend sitting down at the kitchen table with your son or daughter, make a budget and tell them to stick to it. You know, build in a little bit for the unexpected opportunity. Maybe there's a show or, you know, a nice restaurant or something like that that they want to sample or maybe they want to do some holiday shopping or whatever it may be, but uh, they don't want to completely blow the budget. Uh, as I emphasized before, cell phones can be expensive, so uh, check the calling plans in advance. And for your communications uh, internationally, uh, Skype or Zoom or WhatsApp or Facebook, email, uh, those are free and those are the way to go. 
uh, very important, uh, call your bank or credit union before going abroad uh, to tell them that you'll be, or your son or daughter will be in Berlin from this date to that date, so that when they're traveling and they use the ATM uh, card of a, of a machine in Berlin or London or wherever, uh, that it won't be uh, eaten up. Uh, and then, so after you've made that call, call them back, call your bank back a week later to make sure that it's showing up in the system that your son or daughter will be away on the States. Um, tell them to find out what the currency conversion rate is and keep that in mind because it can change. But also when they're out shopping, you know, if it's, um, uh, you know, the conversion rate might seem very favorable, but uh, you know, when you convert it back, it might not be. Uh, they should learn local customs as well about tipping and taxes. Many restaurants abroad will include the tip automatically. Uh, so you don't want to tip twice. So uh, make sure to ask the local staff in the orientation about things of that nature. Now logistics, uh, again, support from our on-site partners. Uh, they are providing pre-departure support via the orientation materials, housing, safety, culture. We've already talked about that. We've talked about the airport pickup. If they arrive on the date during the times that we have told them there is an airport pickup. If they arrive a week early because they're traveling, then of course they'll make their own way to the housing. Uh, or if their plane is delayed and they arrive at midnight, well, there won't be a pickup at that point. They will have to take a taxi in. That's why, again, they should keep that housing information on them, just in case. Uh, cell phones, we've talked about that. Uh, you know, uh, talk, talk to your cell phone company. And then uh, the local partners will have provided some packing information. Now, once they arrive on site, they'll have the orientation and they'll have a walking tour of the neighborhood. As I emphasized, that's ongoing support from the full-time professional staff. Leaky faucets, doctor visits, cultural adjustment, you name it. Um, weekend travel and uh, notifying, you know, where are you going and who are you going with? Uh, that sh they should all be doing that with the local partners. And also, of course, help with homesickness and culture shock. And I should emphasize, every student may have a little bit of this, but rarely do we see it, uh, you know, being too profound, uh, but we just want to keep you um, alerted to the fact that you might get some questions. Now, the academic culture. Global seminars uh, have been created to really provide students with a small class size experience, uh, very different from what they may experience in many of the large lecture halls uh, here on campus. So they might be a little bit surprised that there's a lot more in-class discussion. So in-class discussion, class participation is essential. Um, a large percentage of their grade will actually be based on participation, much larger than in classes on campus. Um, so what do they need to do with this? Well, they need to make sure that they're doing the reading on time, um, that they're, of course, participating in all the excursions because the curriculum of the class really will relate to the visit to the castle or the museum. Um, so they need to remember that this is a study abroad experience first. So prioritize studying uh, and balance that with any other you know, personal exploration. And uh, finally, students uh, should always ask the professor for assistance. These professors have all won teaching awards. They love to teach. Uh, it's a small class setting. So the students really uh, will get a lot out of the experience. And again, they're not on their own in terms of health and safety or in terms of academics. You know, there are people there to help. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the value of this study abroad experience beyond just the five weeks. Um, and I'll, I'll frame it in terms of return on investment uh, because our alumni who have studied abroad say that this is one of the best things they've done to help them with their career. In fact, we surveyed alumni going back 40 years, uh, and those who had studied abroad, of those who had studied abroad, 38.5% said they got their first job as a direct result of their experience studying abroad. And 99% 
said they develop useful, uh, widely transferable job skills, including good communication skills, independence, maturity, the ability to think outside the box. And these are all skills that uh, graduate and professional schools value as well as employers. You know, for example, only 5% of U.S. undergraduate college students study abroad. So they are going to have an experience that really helps set them apart in an increasingly globalized economy. Uh, so employers and graduate schools value these diverse experiences, as well as the academic rigor uh, that the uh, global seminars are known for. So when they return from study abroad, one of the things that you can help emphasize is that they should uh, go to the Career Services Center here on campus to internationalize their resume, to uh, um, learn how to build uh, international experience into their cover letter for jobs or application for graduate school, and also how to create an elevator speech, that 30-second personal commercial where you talk about uh, why you should be admitted to Harvard Medical School or whatever, uh, you know, including the study abroad experience in that is very important. So uh, in terms of career advice, when they come back, visit the Career Services Center uh, for the resume, for the elevator speech, uh, and also remember that the faculty member, the professor, is an ongoing resource. Many of our students say one of the best things about Global Seminars is that they now know a professor at UCSD who knows them. So you can go back, uh, the students can go back to those professors for letters of recommendation for graduate school and scholarships, as well as mentoring or advice. Some of our students have uh, majored in the faculty members area or might pick up a minor after they come back. Uh, you never know. But uh, these professors, uh, even uh, you know, uh, if they're not in the student's major, they know the student well and can write excellent letters. As just one example, uh, Professor Michael Parrish, who teaches our uh, Revell in Edinburgh program, is an esteemed historian. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus, he's taught for 40 years. He routinely writes letters for his students who are going off to medical school, and those students get into medical school. And uh, Professor Parrish is just one. They all will do this, uh, but he was telling me about this the other day. Uh, so even though it may not be in the student's major, graduate schools will value it because What's most important is that the letter reflect the fact that the professor knows the student. Uh, and uh, we're really creating a small college experience for these students and the professors. So here's another area, uh, adjusting when they return. You are an indispensable partner in this area as well. Uh, when they come back, uh, they will want to talk about their experience. And when I came back from studying abroad in Spain more than 30 years ago, you know, family and friends were happy to listen for 10 or 20 minutes, and then, you know, they'd talk about the weather or something else. But I wanted to keep talking and talking and talking. So uh, please be open uh, to hearing about their stories, their perspectives. They may have some really uh, profound insights into what they would like to do with their lives or perspectives on the United States or the rest of the world, uh, their career options. And so this can be a wonderful way to engage with your sons and daughters and stay connected. Also, you can encourage them uh, to stay connected on campus. The International House is a wonderful uh, facility. It's a residence hall that is half U.S. and half international students. Uh, but they also do a lot of programming for the campus community, uh, international language tables, cultural events, wonderful way to meet people from around the world right here on campus. Our study abroad office does uh, numerous returnee events, uh, and there are also many student groups and community service options dealing with uh, diverse groups of folks and immigrants and international issues. So all of this is available back here on campus after they return. Uh, students can also apply to be a student assistant in our study abroad office, uh, should they wish. And uh, some students will actually study abroad again, and we can ha happily facilitate that. So uh, we have uh, 15 minutes, uh, and I will ask my colleague, Tonya Pizer, uh, to moderate the questions. We're happy to take your questions now. While we're waiting for questions, this is Tonya Pizer. I'll just introduce myself. 
I am the advisor in the office for the Athens programs, the programs in Bangkok, Thailand, Edinburgh, and London in the UK, Geneva, Switzerland, and Sydney, Australia, as well as Weimar, Germany. Um, we have another advisor, Cree, who is not here, but our uh, colleague, Lisa Armstrong, will take questions about the countries that I didn't um, mention uh, previously. So um, we have one question. Uh, where will the presentation be posted and when will it be posted? The presentation is being recorded, and if you go to studyabroad.ucsd.edu, you'll see that there is a family tab. And in the next few days, it will be posted as a link on that tab. It depends on how soon we can get to it, but it should be in the next couple of days. If you're able to access chat, I went ahead and posted the link, uh, the direct link there. And this is Lisa Armstrong, by the way. Uh, I'm a study abroad coordinator in the office. Uh, and so I'm here a little bit sitting in for Cree while she's out. We have a question. Will there be a normal amount of homework while students are on the course? Um, this is an intensive five week program and normally the quarters here are 10 weeks. So it has a lot of work, but the professors are very aware that um, they are teaching a course abroad. A lot of the coursework, a lot of the instruction actually happens on site while the students are on academic excursions. And uh, that allows them to teach the material in a way that is, I think, very accessible to the students. And they do have to keep up with the reading, as Jim said previously, but I think that they are still uh, normally able to do so and have a good balance between their academic work and their uh, personal time. I can just add to what Tony has said. Um, I always recommend that students buy the books and start reading them in the period, the two weeks between, let's say, the end of spring quarter and the start of summer session one. And of course, we have a few global seminars that are summer session two. So uh, students can read the first uh, book or two so that when they hit the ground, they, they're reviewing it. They're not reading it for the first time so they can work ahead a little bit. So that can help uh, reduce the, um, you know, the, the, the reading load uh, while they're in the country. Uh, the other thing is that the students do tend to form teams and, and study together, uh, and that always uh, helps. Uh, but we always emphasize these are rigorous uh, academic programs. So, uh, you know, study first, that's the priority. Okay, um, we have a question for students who plan to travel after the program. Can we extend the health insurance? Um, this health insurance is only available to the students during the official dates of the program as well as seven days before or after the program. So there is a little bit of an automatic extension for personal travel, but only for about a week either before or after or some combination of before or after. We're talking about the University of California travel insurance. I would strongly suggest that if your student is traveling longer than that before or after the program, that you look into buying additional travel health insurance. There are a lot of different companies, and I think under the Q&A section of our website, um, uh, globalseminar.ucsd.edu, um, there are some links to how to find out uh, other uh, insurance companies that you could use for private insurance. It's not very expensive to buy travel insurance for a number of weeks. Yeah, that's right. It might cost $50 or so for another month if they're going to backpack across Europe. Uh, and there are several very good companies out there, HTH Worldwide, CISI. Uh, they're all about the same, uh, you know, in terms of quality. Um, but, uh, but yes, they, they, if they're going to be there more than a week, uh, they, they should do that. For the question about the class schedule, each program is a little bit different. The professors will make the decision themselves about which days classes will be held, but typically classes are about three days a week um, with academic excursions on a fourth day and long weekends. That's not always the pattern, but it's a pretty common pattern for our programs so that students will have the chance to explore their study abroad location on their own or travel um, within the region that they're in. Uh, they, of course, have to keep up with their homework and their reading assignments while they're doing that. 
Um, I'm just trying to see, we have a couple of, of health and safety related questions and then I will get back to a question about fee payment. Um, if somebody misses their flight or their flight is delayed, they will have the phone number of the local coordinator who is planning to meet them. And we strongly recommend that they call or email that local coordinator according to the contact information that they have received in their pre-departure materials to let their coordinator know what their new arrival schedule is. If they miss the last shuttle pickup at the airport, then um, the, this question is specifically for Athens. Normally our local coordinator will help arrange a taxi to meet the student at the airport, could be any time, day or night, outside of the official shuttle time. The student would have to pay for that taxi fare because that hasn't been prepaid, but um, there would be somebody waiting there specifically for that student. That's in the case of Athens. They're, they're very, uh, have a very good relationship with a local taxi uh, company. Um, so, uh, like I said, for any of the programs, the most important thing to do would be for the student to contact the local coordinator according to the cell phone number that they have received, carry that cell phone number with them while they're traveling, and they will get um, advice right away about what the next uh, option is if they're not arriving when they expected to arrive. Um, we also have a question about students flying together. Students uh, should already have bought airplane tickets, um, and if they haven't yet, um, it's a good time to do it so that prices don't go up too close to departure. Um, we have a, an arrangement with a student travel agency called STA Travel, and the contact information for a, a travel agent at STA Travel is listed on the front of the Global Seminar website for each program. If the students want help with their plane tickets, they can call that agent, call that 800 number, and um, they will get a live person who knows about our programs and knows about the schedules for our programs and can group all the students who call together to fly together if that's what they want. Uh, we'll have some students leaving out of Northern California, some students leaving out of Southern California, some students with other travel plans. So it's hard to do a mandatory group flight, but it can certainly be arranged that others on the program will be on the same flight. Similarly, we have a closed Facebook group where all of the students on the program have been invited and they can coordinate together if they want to make their own arrangements to fly together. It's not required that the students use STA travel. If they have an other, another way of booking flights online that you or they prefer, that is fine with us, uh, but they can communicate on the Facebook group so that they coordinate their flights. So we know that they do like to travel together often. Um, let me see what else we have. We have a question about traveling from Asia to South Africa and what happens in case the flight is delayed. Uh, would uh, either Jim or Lisa like to talk about that specific uh, travel for the Cape Town South Africa program? Well, I, I think there again, uh, there's some generic advice. Um, our local partners in Cape Town, uh, that information, uh, their contact information, uh, you know, has been uh, provided in the pre-departure orientation materials. So, you know, if they're flying out of Hong Kong and the plane is on the tarmac for several hours because of engine trouble, uh, you know, they need to contact uh, that number uh, and let them know uh, our, you know, arrival time for flight, you know, 157 is, uh, is going to be at this hour and, you know, then they will uh, create a plan. It, it, it doesn't matter which location it is and where they're flying out of, you know, if they're going to be delayed, just contact the local partners in the country and let them know and then they will develop a plan. Uh, the specific question was, should we book an airport hotel in advance just in case? And I no, wouldn't, if no. you're not expecting that no. uh, delay, then I would say no. I would say take the advice in real time of the local partner rather than uh, booking a hotel as a precautionary statement. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we emphasize 
uh, this is a contingency. The vast majority of flights arrive on time. So, uh, you know, we're, we're really talking about the minority of situations, uh, the rare situation where a flight is delayed. Most students arrive on time and don't have these problems. We have a question about safety in youth hostels, in particular in Germany. Um, I would say just normal precautions, like the types of precautions that Jim was talking about regarding um, when you're walking around on the street, keeping your possessions uh, in your control uh, would be the most important thing there, uh, especially if you're staying in a, in a group room with uh, people that you don't know well. Often there are safes provided uh, in that type of hostel where you can keep any valuables. Um, and uh, I think generally you should consider hostels a uh, relatively safe environment as far as personal safety, but uh, the most likely thing to happen would be some kind of uh, loss of personal property. So just take good care of your possessions, be cautious and use the safes that are provided. Um, I would also add to that uh, uh, very good advice from Tonya. You know, uh, practice the buddy system. So if they're going to be traveling, travel with someone else. You know, that always is helpful. Uh, and, uh, you know, the thing about youth hostels is uh, there's not as much privacy, but the flip side of it is you do get to meet new people. So that's also, there. there is some value to that. You can meet young people from around the world. Most of these hostels are safe uh, and clean and very affordable uh, for college students. But, you know, use common sense. And obviously, if, if something doesn't feel right, you know, call the authorities. Um, we have a question about vaccinations required for Edinburgh. We have had all of our students do a health screening at the student health office here on campus. Um, or at a private doctor if they're going to a low risk country as part of their application. And as part of that health screening, their doctor or student health would have discussed with them whether any vaccines were needed. Normally for uh, countries in the European Union, the vaccine requirements would be the same as the United States. So just make sure that they're up to date on what they would have for routine immunizations here in this country. And if they are required, we're not medical professionals, but we have asked that they meet with medical professionals uh, to get advice about uh, required or recommended vaccines for other countries uh, where there may be some of those requirements. Um, so I think the students already have that information. Uh, we also have a question about a, a need for additional health insurance. We, if the students are only going to be traveling during the time of their own, the dates of their own program, then they have health insurance included as part of the program. It would only be needed if they were traveling more than a week extra during the time that they're abroad. Um, let me see if we have any other health and safety questions before we move on to uh, other, other questions. Um, the students will all be met at the airport for their program if they are arriving during the arrival window that we've specified on our website. So someone asked specifically about Sydney and that's the case for Sydney as well. Okay, so we have another question about paying fees. Uh, the fee payment is going to happen on the regular summer session schedule. So if you go to summer.ucsd.edu, I'll type that here, um, then uh, you can get uh, a calendar where you can, oops, and I just sent it to the pan panelists. Let me try one more time. Uh, summer.ucsd.edu, um, then you will get a calendar that shows exactly when the fees are due for each summer session. And the fee payment will happen through Triton Link or on campus at the university cashier, just as when a student is paying for their regular term here on campus. A visa is not required. We have another question about visa requirements for going on the programs. I know Jim mentioned a visa at one point. 
United States citizens do not need a visa to go for most of our programs to go to any of the programs in Europe or the UK. Um, United States citizens do need a visa for the Thailand program because that program is more, is longer than the uh, month visa that you get automatically uh, if you enter Thailand as a US citizen. And we have advised the students on how to do that. The students also need to do something called an electronic travel authority, ETA, for the Sydney Australia program if they're US citizens. And we've advised the students on how to do that. And the Cape Town and Zambia program also um, has some visa requirements, which the students will find out about. If students are not US citizens, they will have different visa requirements. And we have tried to reach out to each student individually if they are in that situation to advise them on what they need to do for their visa. So you can ask them if they have uh, met with us already, if they're not a US citizen, about what they need to do for their visa. Um, Jim or Lisa, do you have anything to add about visas? I would simply add that if they do need a visa, you know, and they, they have to get it prior to departure, uh, they, they should not procrastinate on that. Uh, visas can take a while. Uh, you know what it's like to get your driver's license renewed at the DMV. We'll multiply that by 10. And, you know, uh, so you, you can't pick one up the next day. You, you really have to plan in advance. And we've told the students that, but if you know your sons and daughters and if they happen to It'd be a little too busy or maybe they procrastinate it they, they have to get on that immediately uh, and the other thing that i would add is if they are having trouble or encountering any difficulty with the visa process if they do need a visa um, to let us know where they're encountering that trouble so we can help them and any other students that that situation may come come up for okay we have another question about the tuition uh, the tuition will be posted to the student's account um, just like any other term, just as if they were doing summer session here on campus. For summer session one programs, that's going to be early June. I believe the date is June 2nd, but you can look on the calendar that's on that summer session website to see the exact date. And um, for summer session two, it's about a month later. Uh, it's also on that calendar. Um, how many days in advance can someone arrive? We have, um, and uh, really we're expecting students to arrive on the official arrival date for the program that's posted on the website. If they arrive earlier, it's their own responsibility to make arrangements and find housing and make arrangements to meet the other students at their program housing on the official first day. So some students choose to be independent in that way, but they won't be um, met at the airport if they arrive early and they won't have housing provided. Um, I appreciate the thank you. Uh, who just posted that it's been helpful. Uh, we want to answer all your questions and be available. So um, even after this orientation, if there are questions that you would like to get to us, um, we are available and we uh, also are very much available to your students to uh, ask, to answer specific things related to their situation. We have to be careful about uh, the FERPA regulations, but uh, your student could sign a FERPA form if you wanted to ask us specific things about their attendance on the program. Um, we have one more question. Uh, someone who's traveling to Rome, are the students staying in the same housing building and how many students do they share a room with? Um, Lisa, do you know the housing details for Rome? Uh, yeah, they'll be staying in local apartments with two to three students per room. Um, I don't uh, have the detail about whether there are multiple rooms in an apartment right now, um, but uh, the students should have that information, so you can always double check with them, uh, and then they can always ask Craig, who really has her pulse uh, and access to those details more readily available. Are there any other questions? I think I've covered everything. Um, it was asked at this point. An approximate budget for study abroad. Um, the, the budgets are on our website, so you can check that for each global seminar. They do vary, uh, so it, it's not possible to really generalize that. But again, each program has a specific budget on its website. So go to globalseminar.ucsd.edu, click on your son or daughter's location, whether it's math and Rome or uh, you know the 
Kafka and Prague program or whichever one, and then you can look under the, the, the budget and finance. Oh, and Lisa has uh, just helpfully provided the Global Seminar uh, link. Thank you, Lisa. Um, when students fly to their destinations, are there any forms they need to fill in before arriving? Um, most times when you're on an international flight, there is an arrival card that is handed out by the flight attendants that the students will need to fill out. And that arrival card will ask things perhaps like how much money are you bringing into the country or are you bringing any food or what is the address that you're planning on staying at and how long are you going to be there? What are the dates that you're gonna be in the country? Um, so the students will need to have that type of information, especially the contact information for their housing and the contact information for their on-site partner uh, with them in their carry-on or in their purse on their person in order to fill out this form for arrival in the country. So we do recommend in our orientations that they have that information available so that they can fill out the arrival card for immigration into the country. I don't see any more questions. I want to thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. And uh, Jim, do you have any last? Conclusions. Well, I would just like to thank all of you for joining us on this webinar. We find that the um, students whose family uh, participate in the webinar are the very best prepared. And so we thank you for your partnership. Uh, and we're committed to making this an outstanding educational and personal experience uh, for your sons and daughters. Uh, and if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you.